in order for us to fully understand the causes of the Civil War, we really need to take a look back at some of the important things that happen in U.S. history um, from before the official start of the Civil War. And so we're going to take a look at many of the different things that take place in the lead up to the Civil War that create an environment where um, a majority of the southern states in the United States are going to secede from the Union um, and, and, and attempt to create their own nation um, and the fighting that ensues. So in order for us to do this, we have to take a look back. Some things to remember is that um, each individual unit has different topics and themes. And in Oklahoma history and in um, our study of U.S. history, we are going to continue to look at um, a nation that is expanding, that is developing its own culture, and we're going to focus in on a lot of the things that lead to the fighting of the Civil War that focus mainly on a lot of things that politicians have to decide. And when they decide these things, it creates division. And when we continue to create that division or this division, um, it leads to the violence that we um, see in the Civil War. So a uh, review from eighth grade for most of us is that um, when this event takes place in the 1860s um, and, and previously, people are moving west. And California has a massive amount of immigration in the 1850s, so people are moving all the way to the West Coast. Most of the people moving west move to the Great Plains. So in the early times, in the early days of the westward expansion, so even before 1850, um, many people are going to be moving to the Great Plains. So that's north of, of Oklahoma to places like Missouri. As people move to the plains, more and more people want to um, make their territory into um, a state of their own. So the issue is that, that, are, that arises um, very, very quickly is should these states enter as free states or should they enter as states that allow slavery? By this time, so we're, we're talking early 1800s here. There are many states and there are many provisions that, that Congress has passed that state that future states should be closed to slavery. The majority of northern states have outlawed slavery by this time, and a majority of southern states are um, proponents of slavery, encouraging, and, and in many cases wanting to expand it. So this is a critical question that, that Congress and each individual state will have to grapple with is, should they, new states, enter as free states or slave states? So here's what a, here is um, what the map of the United States looks like in 1850, um, between 1850 and 1853. The reason why we have a neutral strip in the panhandle is because of what we're going to be talking about next, which is the Missouri Compromise. So all of the pink are states. The uh, yellow is controlled by, or the gold is controlled by the United States, but it's not a state yet. So uh, people that would consider themselves to be Americans live in unorganized territory, New Mexico, Utah, Oregon, and Minnesota but they are still under the jurisdiction or the control of the United States. They're just not a state yet. Whereas the Gasden Purchase in what is today um, New Mexico and Arizona, those are controlled by the Mexican government. Russia controls Alaska, and Hawaii is its own state, is its own kingdom. Excuse me. So this is what the United States looks like. We have to go back, though, in order to fully understand what is going on. We have to have a little bit of a discussion on what creates the division that leads to the fighting of the Civil War. So first, we want to talk about 
what the northern states relied on economically, what the southern states relied on economically, and what did the north and the south do differently. So first, we want to make clear that as we talk about the causes of the Civil War, we don't want to immediately think that the South was the bad guys and the North were the good guys. And we don't want to automatically pin ourselves to say that the Northern states only did manufacturing, which is what they did rely on economically. The northern states did also farm. There were, there is, and there still is, a lot of good farmland in a lot of places that are northern. And there are people, especially in the Midwest, that are northern that did a lot of farming. States like Indiana and southern Illinois, very, very fertile land for farming. Um, But we often think too much, and I do this too in my teaching, that we just say, The northern states, they were the manufacturers. The southern states were the farmers, and they they did neither thing um, well, um, the other thing well, and so that's why we focus on the the other things. Is it true that most of the northern states and the main cities in those northern states were more economically developed in terms of manufacturing and, and, and industrialization? Yes. Did that mean that they were not, that they did not do any farming? No. The same is true of what the southern states did. So many of the southern states relied exclusively on agriculture, farming. But that's not to say that they didn't do other things as well. Southern states also had some industry. Think about states like Georgia, for example, had industry. Cities like Savannah and Atlanta are growing as populous places for industrialization to take hold. And that should make sense because if the South is doing a lot of farming, which they were, it's really expensive to ship your cotton that you're growing in Mississippi to a place like Chicago when you could just ship it a state over or two states over to to Georgia. But the infrastructure of the South made that difficult. And so there's a lot of times only instances where farmers in the South relied heavily on manufacturers in the North, um, and that is where they decided to um, put down railroad lines, like we talked about in Oklahoma history and in eighth grade U.S. history. So what did they do differently? Well, for one, and a really important thing, is the idea that the North and the South won because one relied on manufacturing and the other relied on agriculture. Um, both of these um, of of these regions did some similar things. Okay, but the things that they did differently was that one group, southern states, relied on slave labor, where the northern states did not. That's not to say that Northerners were not uh, racist, and that's not to say that Southerners were not abolitionists as well. But the institutions of slavery were protected by Southern states, and the institution of slavery was outlawed by Northern states. And that's a key difference between these two, other than farming and agriculture and manufacturing and industrialization. So to to begin, we're going to take a look at Missouri. And Missouri will want to become a state in 1820, along with the state of Maine. Missouri wants to own slave states. People living in the North wanted slavery to be abolished. And we're talking about senators and Congress people living in the North were abolitionists. Many of them were. They wanted slavery to be abolished. The South did not believe that Congress had the power to outlaw slavery. The southern states' views on slavery were that it was a state-by-state decision. They viewed that each state should have the independence to decide whether or not they should outlaw slavery. This is called popular sovereignty. And it's a key, it's a key um, idea moving forward. We won't get to popular sovereignty until... Um, the Kansas and Nebraska Act, but many Southern states believed that popular sovereignty was the way things should go. So Congress is going to meet, and they're going to come up with a compromise that is creatively known as the Missouri Compromise in 1820. 
And no one wanted to mis- make a mistake because Missouri was growing very significantly at this time. Remember when we discussed the Oregon, Santa Fe, and Chisholm trails, most of those trails begin in the state of Missouri, Independence, Missouri, and St. Louis. And both of these cities grow into a main kind of crossroad between the the east and the west and the north and the south which is why the city of St. Louis famously has the Gateway Arch. Missouri would be entered in to the Union as a slave state in 1820. Maine would be entered in as a free state. The additional thing that Congress said was that any future states to the north of Missouri's southern border would now be free territory. So what they're able to do is maintain balance in Congress and in the nation by admitting Missouri and admitting Maine as one, um, one as a slave state, and one as a, as, a, as a free state. But the key is any future state in territory north of Missouri's southern border would be free. So when we look at this map from earlier, this is Missouri's southern border. You'll notice that Missouri's southern border, if we do a line of latitude on Missouri's southern border, it is this northern border of Texas that is that we know today is the line of Missouri's southern border. So Texas, wanting to own slaves and becoming a state in 1848, which we'll get to um, on uh, lecture number two, Texas wants to become a slave state, but precedent says that any territory north of Missouri's southern border has to be free, so the neutral strip had to be uh, free of slavery. Texas didn't want that. So they give that part or that portion of the land to the U.S. government. Remember, this is already in 1848. This is um, a, a strip of land that is adjacent to Indian territory and Oklahoma territory. And this adjacent strip will become the panhandle of Oklahoma that we have today. So Missouri's southern border, theoretically speaking, should then outlaw slavery to all of the states that are north of Missouri's southern border, including Kansas, Nebraska, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, Iowa is already a state, Nebraska, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington. All of these states should be free. As with most things in Congress, Many of the uh, things that they decide about Missouri and in the Missouri Compromise of 1820 are not going to hold up for very long. They'll hold up for about 36 years. And eventually, these compromises will have to be revisited. And when they are revisited, they are changed. And when they're changed, this is going to lead to the division that we're talking about. 